Tonight we're going to do the four spiritual laws, and uh, not all of these start with a number. Good evening. Not all of these start with, an e uh, with, a, with a number, but we have done three circles and four spiritual laws. I've gotten contacted a few times by people who've said, hey, I just got to share the three, the three circles with somebody. So I think that was probably a, a winner, that even without all the uh, advanced training, people are already using that and sharing it with others, too, for them to be able to, uh, to share the gospel. So tonight we're going to talk about the four spiritual laws. This was put together by Campus Crusade for Christ uh, years ago. I believe Bill Bright, who was the, the leader of that ministry, is the one who devised the four spiritual laws. Um, I've seen this for years. You've probably seen this, even if you didn't hear it called by that name. Uh, I know at one point they were using tracks with the four spiritual laws through the Billy Graham Association. I think that's where I came into contact with it when I was training to be a Billy Graham counselor at his Oklahoma City Crusade in 2003, um, which is a lot longer ago than I realized. That was a long time ago. Uh, the four spiritual laws, I'm, I'm going to tell you, when I, when I started looking at the four spiritual laws online to, to put a presentation together for you, I found that Campus Crusade for Christ, or now they call themselves Crew, I don't really know why, but same ministry, uh, they, have a, they have a separate website for this four spiritual laws, and they have several different presentations. Uh, in addition to having several different languages there, they also have different, uh, I don't know if they're culturally specific, all of them, uh, but different English versions where, for example, they have, a, uh, they have a version that you would use with English speakers on the Native American reservations, and it's worded just a little bit differently. doesn't change the gospel message, but it may make it a little bit more understandable in a particular cultural context. Um, I say that to say this. The normal four spiritual laws, the reason I haven't used it much is because I didn't like the way they phrased the first spiritual law. The way that they typically have phrased the first spiritual law is God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Now, that's true, right? We, we believe that to be true. God loves you. Believe that to be absolutely true. God has a wonderful plan for your life. I also believe that's true. But when you're going into somebody that needs to hear the gospel, somebody without somebody who is not a believer and doesn't have that understanding of Christianity already, I think the phrase has a wonderful plan for your life could be misleading. I think it could lead people to think once you come to Christ, everything's just going to be wonderful. I've even heard people say that when giving their testimony. You know, I can't I, this is what happened and I came to Christ years ago and everything's been wonderful ever since. It has not. <laughs> we all know it hasn't. Uh, I mean, maybe it has worked out wonderfully overall. Maybe you understand that God has a purpose in everything you've gone through, and maybe that's what we mean. But when you're giving your testimony to somebody, you don't want to say, oh, everything's just been perfect. Because yeah. at best, well, maybe at worst, you're misleading them, and they don't know it. Or it's possible they know... They know you're full of beans anyway. <laughs> your life, there's no way your life has been perfect since Jesus. But I noticed in one of their English presentations that they had phrased it a little differently. God loves you and created you to know him personally. And I thought that is a much better way to say that. God created you or God loves you and created you to know him personally. God does have a wonderful plan for your life. From this side, and maybe even more so from eternity, we can see that it was a wonderful plan, but it doesn't always feel wonderful in the moment. So rather than give them something that's ambiguous, something that could lead them to, to think things that aren't necessarily true, I think it's much, much more effective to be as clear as we possibly can about what we're actually saying. God loves you, and he created you to know him personally. Um, a lot of people that don't know Christ as their Savior, do believe in God. I mean, there's going to be atheists everywhere. But most people in America still profess to believe in God. They just would say, well, I don't know him. They might even say, I don't know that God is knowable. There's a whole brand of agnosticism that 
we think of agnostic being somebody who says, I don't know if there's a God or not. There's a whole branch of agnosticism that says, there probably is a God, but I don't believe he's knowable. We, in contrast, say God, God is real, God loves you, and he created you to know him. Not just know things about him, but to know him personally, to have this relationship. And we can take them to where the scriptures talk about God's love. And perhaps the most familiar verse of scripture for most people, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God went through all of the work of earning, of, of purchasing our salvation, of paying for our salvation, of sending Jesus to do that because he loved us. I heard a preacher say years ago, no, it was just so he could receive the glory. Okay, no. <laughs> I think he is glorified. I know that he's glorified by the plan of salvation. I know he's glorified in being able to transform sinners. But he's worthy of glory and honor if he'd never done anything for us just because of who he is. The Bible says, for God so loved the world. God loved the world in this way. This is how God showed his love to us. And, and elsewhere in Romans it says God commends or demonstrates his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so we take them and we explain to them from the scriptures, and this is just one example. There are others that you could use, but this is just one example where the scriptures make it clear God does love us. And to that person who feels like, yeah, there's probably a God out there somewhere, but I don't know him, and he probably doesn't like me if he knows what I've done. We need to make it clear God does love them. And we know that not because it's my opinion, but because he said so in his word. And God has a plan for us, and that plan is to know him personally. God's plan, John 17, 3 says, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. What is God's desire for each of us? It's for us to, to know him. And that, that word is, that, that word has so many contexts, so many um, Shades of meaning to it, the way we use it. Oh, do you know so-and-so? Uh, somebody was in my office today and said, do you know so-and-so? And I finally had to tell him, I don't think you realize that I'm, I'm new here in town. I don't know all that many people. Well, do you know this person? I've heard the name. <laughs> I've heard the name. That's my answer to a lot of things. I've heard the name. Yes, in that sense, I know that person because I know who they are. They couldn't pick me out of a lineup. Okay. Do you know Governor Stitt? I met him one time at the Capitol. He wouldn't have a clue who I am, okay? <laughs> so, yes, I know Kevin Stitt. I know my wife. Two totally different ways of, of no. I can tell you, I know, oh, sometimes she surprises me, but a lot of times I can tell you what she's going to say before she says it. Because I know her. And when the Bible says God, God desires us to know him, it's that kind of intimate relationship where we, we really do know him experientially. As a, as a friend of mine in ministry used to say, if we were cowboys, we would say we've ridden together some. You know, you've, you've spent time together and you know each other. That's God's desire. So to, to those who feel alienated from the God who's out there somewhere, they need to know that God loves them and God desires not only to know them, but for, for them to know him as well and understand the lengths that he's gone to to make that happen. So if, if that's what God wants, what is it that prevents us from knowing God personally? We come to the second spiritual law. Man is sinful and separated from God, so we cannot know him personally or experience his love. It's our sin that stands in the way. And we may need to define sin. Sin is anything that uh, that displeases God, anything that dishonors Him, anything that uh, is, uh, is disobedient to Him, anything where He says, do this, and we don't do it, or that He says, don't do that, and we do it anyway. Okay, we, can, we can sin in action and in inaction also. And the Bible says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You may be seeing some verses repeated in some of these gospel presentations. Um, when you start to see particular verses pop up in different, uh, different presentations, 
You might write those down, or you've, you've, you've got the handouts too. You might highlight those, those that are starting to sound familiar. Whatever gospel presentation you use, or if you just come up with your own, you just share scriptures you know, those are going to be some helpful ones. This is one of them. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I have, you have, they have. We can think of the best people we know. We can think of, you know, my, my, my little purple-haired great-grandmother who used to drive her 70s Plymouth only to church on Sundays and was there every time the door. She was a sinner who had fallen short of the glory of God. See, the Bible teaches that man was created to have fellowship with God. We were created to have this intimate relationship with Him. But because of our own stubborn self-will, we chose to go our own independent way and that fellowship with God was broken. Sort of like if you've ever had a child who lied to you and you thought, I'm not going to call them on it yet. I'm just going to see how long this goes on and give them enough rope to hang themselves, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And they've lied and they know they've lied and you know they've lied. And you're not sure whether they know you know they know they've lied. <laughs> We could go. The fellowship's not quite ought, uh, what it ought to be, right? Until until the air is cleared, and that's sort of where we stand with God. That fellowship is broken. This self-willed attitude, this attitude of active rebellion, or sometimes just passive indifference toward God, is evidence of what the Bible calls sin. And some people will say, "Well, I'm I'm a good person." Maybe from a human perspective, but from God's perspective, there's no such thing as a, a good person. We're, we're not good people who occasionally mess up. Even our attitudes are in rebellion against God. We may not do anything all that, all that bad, but we've still got these, these hearts that are sinful. You know, you, you could look at me and say, I mean, uh, just for an example, you could look at me and say, well, there's, there's a good person. I mean, he's a pastor. He doesn't drink. He doesn't cheat on his wife. He doesn't, you know, all the things you're not supposed to do, he doesn't do that. I live a fairly boring life, all right? <laughs> and you might look and say, oh, that's a good person. No, because I know the attitudes that are in here still. I'm still a sinner. And this heart, apart from Jesus Christ, is not what it ought to be. And so that, that sin, and it's in each of us, whether we do the bad things or not. And because of that, man is separated from God. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. And, and understand, too, I'm going through this probably in more detail, again, than what you may want to do with them. I, I want to get you more familiar with it. We can get you additional training, too. But I want you to be a little more familiar with some of the details walking through this. You may just have time to hit bullet points with somebody. So don't feel like you've got to do a solid 30 minutes on the, uh, on the four spiritual laws. The wages of sin is death. Those who, uh, Second Thessalonians said, those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord. And people can argue whether they think that's fair or not. That's a separate discussion. Um, I come down on the side of whatever God does is right. But people disagree. They can disagree on that, but God's, God's still going to do what God's going to do. And this is the way it is. That we are separated from God, and the wages of sin, what we earn from sin, is death. And there's an illustration given of this. There's the holiness of God and sinful man down here, and none of us measure up. None of us are able to, to reach to a holy God. This diagram illustrates, I see here I've got notes that would probably help me explain it better than I just did. This diagram illustrates that God is holy and man is sinful and there's a great gulf, there's a big gap between the two. And the arrows show that man is continually trying to reach God and establish the personal relationship through his own efforts, such as good life, philosophy, or religion, but he inevitably fails. Now, the Bible teaches that we're, we're not actually seeking God. In, in our sinful condition, God seeks us out. But we do know there's something. We, we talked about that with the, four, uh, with the three circles. The numbers are going to trip me up here. The three circles. We try, to, we try to deal with that brokenness by putting anything else in there we can. So even, even if man's not actively 
searching for God, we're searching for what God offers. We just don't know where to find it. And we never can reach there. We inevitably fail. And if we do try to measure up to God and God's standards, we, we're definitely going to fail. And the third principle, the third spiritual law, explains the only way to bridge this gulf between the two of us. That third spiritual law is that Jesus Christ is God's only provision for man's sin. Through him alone, we can know God personally and experience God's love. He is the only way to deal with the problem of sin, and he's the only way for us to have that relationship with God where we know him personally. That's because he died in our place. The book of Romans says God demonstrates his own, I quoted this earlier, God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't just, he didn't just get himself killed. I was reading a conversation about this just recently. I'm trying to remember where, but I know they were going back and forth over, well, yeah, he, he just got himself killed. I mean, it, it doesn't prove anything. If, he, if I'd said the things he said, I would have gotten killed too. Listen, Jesus didn't get killed by accident. He told his followers in advance it was going to happen. It says that on his final trip to Jerusalem, he, he set his face like stone to go. To, he was determined to go there for this purpose. He didn't just get himself killed. He did it on purpose. As much as they thought they were putting him to death, the Apostle Peter later said it was by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. It was all God's plan. And he did it for us. He didn't do it to set an example. He didn't do it to prove a point. He did it to pay for our sin and to reconcile us to a holy God. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then he rose from the dead. And it's important that we not leave this out because, again, talking about his death, anybody could get, them, anybody could get killed, right? Unless his return, uh, well, unless he were to return right now, none of us are getting out of this world alive, right? The, the fatality rate is one. It's all of us. Everybody dies, but Jesus rose from the dead. And I've been doing lots of study on this lately. There are all kinds of people throughout ancient history that, that they claim they rose from the dead. Jesus is the only one with serious historical evidence indicating that he rose from the dead. It's not something that happens every day. As a matter of fact, it's not something that happens without God being involved. Jesus rose from the dead, and that's important because it proves, it proves everything he claimed about his death. I, would, I want to say it was Steve Dace on the radio was talking about this and said, you know, I have a policy when a guy rises from the dead, I just pretty much believe what he says about everything else. <laughs> I like that. Him rising from the dead, the, the Bible says Christ died for our sins, he was buried, and he rose again the third day. When he rose again from the dead, it proved that he was God in human flesh as he said he was and that he was dying to pay for our sins, that he was dying to, to be the acceptable sacrifice before God, that he was dying to reconcile us to God. It proves that he was everything he said he was and that he could do everything he said he would do. And because of that, he is the only way to God. He's the only one who died in our place. He's the only one who rose again to prove it. Then he's the only way to God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I've shared with you before on a Sunday morning, some people will say, well, you can't read it with that inflection. He wasn't claiming to be the only way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's talking about what he's like. You can't read it with that inflection. The way, the truth, the life. What about what he says next? No man comes unto the Father but by me. If the, the, the is too ambiguous for us, he clears it up. No man comes to the Father but by me. You can't... You can't look at that and say he wasn't making an exclusive claim without doing violence to the English language, all right, or to, to what was originally written. Jesus himself claimed to be the only way to God, all right? You can, you can believe him. You can disbelieve him. But you can't say, well, I believe in him as something less. Because I like what C.S. Lewis said. He's either... Uh, liar, lunatic, or lord. Now, Lee Strobel says there's, there's another option. He's liar, lunatic, legend, or lord. But he makes the, the case that between Jesus' death and resurrection, 
and the times it was written down, there wasn't enough time for it to grow into a legend. So you, you're left with Jesus either being someone who knew that he was not God and claimed to be anyway, that he was a liar. Why would you listen to him about his moral and religious teachings? Or he was a lunatic. He, he thought he was God when he wasn't. Again, why would you listen to him? I've met crazy people. I've met people who thought they were things they weren't. And we can love them, but I'm not going to base my life around what they, what they say. He's one of those things, or he is what he claimed to be. He, he claimed to be the only way to God. And this diagram here illustrates that God has bridged the gulf that separates us. We've seen the gulf already in the previous illustration between holy God and sinful man, how we couldn't bridge that gulf. But God bridged the gulf that separates us from him by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross in our place to pay the penalty for our sins. Jesus is the, is the bridge. He's the way across that gulf. But it's not just enough to know those truths, like we talked about the difference between knowing about something or someone and, and actually knowing them. It's not just enough to know these facts. We must individually receive Jesus Christ. This is the fourth spiritual law. We must individually receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Then we can know God personally and experience his love. When it says we must receive Christ, it's because John 1.12 says, As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. To those who believe in Jesus, God has given us not even the privilege. He's given us the right to call ourselves his children. He has adopted us into his family through Christ, not, not through what we earn, not through what we, we try to go out and work for and try to deserve, but because Jesus has paid everything and he has bridged the gap. Now we're able to come to the Father through Jesus and we are adopted into his family when we receive him. Now, to, to receive him means to acknowledge him as your Lord and Savior and to ask for forgiveness, believing that he's the only one to prove it we receive him by faith Ephesians 2 says for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God not of works lest anyone should boast that is it's not the only place where it teaches this in scripture but it's one of the clearest examples of the fact that we can't earn it or deserve it our, our standing with God our relationship with God is not dependent on our performance or anything that we have to do, anything that we have to earn. And so many of the people that we will run into and that we will share the gospel with, so many of them are in a mindset that, well, I've just got to try harder. Give me some time. I'll get my life together. I'll get straightened out one of these days. Then, then God will love me. I'll come back. I'll, I'll come to church and all that, and then I can, you know, God, God and I will be fine. <clears throat> But you head down that road, you will always feel, you will always feel like you do not measure up. And there's a reason for that. I mean, I, I would, I'm, I'm not going to, but I could almost ask for a show of hands and say, how many of us as believers in here tonight would say, oh, I feel all the time still like I don't measure up. I won't ask you to raise your hand, but I'll raise mine. Frequently, I think, God, why do you love me? I mean, I know from a theological, <clears throat> from a theological standpoint that he loves me because he is love. It's who he is. And I know that he loves me because I'm his. Through Jesus Christ, I'm his. But beyond that, I, 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 look, at, uh, I look at how I think. And I look at the feelings and the attitudes that I, I see in myself still after around 30 years of walking with Jesus Christ, and I see the sin still in me, and I just am in awe that God would love me. And so if 30 years into a relationship with Christ, we're still saying, no, I, I wouldn't measure up. If, if this depended on my performance, I wouldn't measure up. The people that we're talking to and dealing with, if they're thinking, one of these days I'll straighten up and I'll try harder or not, 
they're just going to be spinning, 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 spinning like a hamster on a wheel. Running as hard as they can and never getting anywhere. We have got to do all that we can to help them understand it's not for them to do. Now, that doesn't mean go out and live however you want. But it's not for us to earn or deserve. It's for us to rely on what Jesus has already earned for us. It's by faith. We simply believe that when he says it's yours, he means what he says. And I really thought I had another slide after that. But I think that summarizes it for us. And I really do think this right here is the key. Now, we are not in the... Uh, we're not in the Bible Belt culture that we once were. Um, and so we can't, we can't rely on the fact that, well, everybody's at least been to church. Everybody knows something about the Bible. That might have been true at one point. Even those who weren't Christians had some Christian memory, some Christian background. Maybe they'd been to church with their parents or with grandma. But now in some cases, we're dealing with people three generations removed or more from Christianity. that they may not all know, here's what Jesus did. And we need to be able to tell them. But hear me on this, there are still people, there are still a lot of people around us who do have some understanding, yeah, Jesus died on the cross, I get that. Yeah, y'all believe he rose again from the dead. But they still think that our message is be good and try harder. And if we want people to respond to the gospel, I mean, it's, it's the Holy Spirit that's going to work on them. But we can remove a lot of obstacles if we try to plow that ground to help them understand faith by grace through faith. It's not for you to earn or deserve. It's not do better, try harder, be, be, be good. It's you can't be good enough, but Jesus Christ was. And Jesus Christ is. All right. Do you have any questions or comments on the four spiritual laws? I've given you these handouts that... Okay. I was thrown off. To, to those of you who have the handout either from getting it on the website or picking it up here, if you look at it, I thought, there should be more. There's only six slides here. That's because I did them incrementally. So I gave you the last the last one from each slide. So it has all the information on here. It's just not spread out. You've got that information that gives you a basic outline of the four spiritual laws. I believe there's more training, more materials available for that. Um, and if you'd, if you'd like any of that kind of stuff, let me know. We can, we can get that into your hands. I'm sorry. I asked if you had questions and then I kept filibustering the meeting. So do, do you have any questions? I would say for for those who and I, I've had some experience with this, but the, the ones that think I've got to get my act cleaned up before I can come to church, it's kind of like breaking your leg and saying, "I'll go to the doctor when it heals up." There you go. It's kind of backwards. That's that's a really good point. Once for, you get healed up, you don't. That's you're not that's so, right. That's a good point for those who. Uh, or watching online, in case you didn't hear that, uh, he he said, for those who say, "Well, I'll uh, I'll come to God once I get my life cleaned up," it's kind of like breaking your leg and saying, "I'll go to the doctor once it heals." Uh, that's that's an excellent mm -hmm. analogy.